Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher, and this is the lecture at the end of week two. And uh, as we did in the first week, we're going to kind of wrap some things up and uh, review a few things, add a couple of things here and there, um, just to try to pull everything together um, on the subject of statistics. First, we'll go back to our motivation. Um, and this is, I, I don't want this to seem like a pontification, but, uh, but many people have different uh, attitudes or philosophies, opinions about what nanotechnology is and is not. I think for me, it's that we're exploiting some subcontinuum effects that are useful technologically. And normally, for something to be useful technologically, it has to have uh, an effect, it has to have a manifestation at a human scale. And so what we try to do, now that we, we have that sort of as a baseline, uh, in order to have an effect at a human scale, most things would have to be working in concert with each other. In other words, we'd, we'd have to have many nanoscale objects working together, and that suddenly brings in the idea, or essentially brings in the idea of statistical mechanics. We need to know how all of these different nano objects might be working together and in order to affect some kind of, of outcome, some uh, useful outcome that we would call a technology. So that's, if we're interested in those kinds of effects, but using nanoscale materials and features and phenomena, then we have to understand to some extent how these entities uh, collectively behave and how things like energy are, are distributed uh, throughout the, the possible range of, of uh, their spaces. And in this case, we're gonna be especially interested in reciprocal space. So we introduced a number of of ensembles, particle ensembles, and we talked about uh, how we could allow energy and the number of particles and the volume to vary or, or to be fixed. We introduced a partition function uh, for different types of ensembles that's basically a normalizing factor. Just make sure that, that when I have all the statistics there, that the probabilities of a state being occupied in a certain way, um, or a different state being occupied with a different probability, those all those probabilities all add up to one. So that's what the partition function does. There are some restrictions on, especially on on n, the number of particles in a given state, um, and we call that an occupation number, that capital N. Um, and the restrictions come from other principles. So for electrons, the restrictions are different than they are for phonons and photons and molecules, gas molecules, and the like. Um, and so we we average this occupation number. That is synonymous with our distribution function f. And and here forward we'll use this distribution function f. The superscript O here signifies that it's an equilibrium distribution function. And there's a common form, but subtle differences in this distribution function can have a big impact on the actual numbers. Uh, that it produces or that it predicts. So if this gamma term in the denominator is one, then we have Fermi Dirac statistics. That means that the occupation number can be either zero or one and its average is F. Um, if gamma on the other hand is minus one, then we can have, then we have Bose-Einstein statistics which cover phonons and photons, and we can have a different set of numbers. That's when the number of particles in a given state is not uh, prescribed to zero or one. And then lastly, and we, we really won't have time to talk about this too much, um, when gamma equals zero, it's more of a classical type of distribution, a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And we saw, at least for the phonons, for the Bose-Einstein statistics, that if our energies are high enough, then the Bose-Einstein statistic uh, converges to the Maxwell uh, statistic. So we also then went into this idea of density of states for phonons and for electrons. And uh, in, in both cases, the uh, we, we kind of divided K space, this reciprocal space, up into points, just like we would have a lattice of points in real space, and those points could represent atoms or atomic locations. And we found that the, uh, that 
each point in K space, whether I'm in one dimension or two dimensions or three dimensions, each point is surrounded by an empty space of 2 pi over L. So 2 pi over L is the period between points. So if we have a two-dimensional problem, then the number of allowable states or modes, we'll call that, is again, we, we use the symbol capital N for this, but, but uh, it, when it's uh, expressed as a function of K, that means we're talking about the number of modes. So what we did is we drew a circle in this two-dimensional space and said that that was an area of K space, that's pi times K squared, where K here is the is the radius of K space. And we divide by the amount of space occupied in K space by a single point, and that's just gonna be two pi over L all squared. Excuse me, all squared. Then we had this idea of density of states. And for, for this, uh, in this case, we're going to do density of states in terms of uh, angular frequency omega. That's what we usually do for phonons. For electrons, we usually do it in terms of energy E. Um, but the density of states will be this number n uh, differentiated with respect to omega. And then on the next slide, we'll talk about dimensional effects. And so just carrying out that simple derivative and using the chain rule gives us an expression where the density of states depends on k. k in turn depends on omega. That was through a dispersion relation. And then here we have the denominator. We've actually flipped that uh, dkd omega and put it in the denominator because the derivative of omega with respect to k is our group velocity. Now in the different dimensions, when we make this dimensionally specific, we will divide by the dimensionality, by the, the scale of the dimension, and that in, in 1D is L, in 2D it's L squared, in 3D it's L cubed. The, the nice thing here is that those Ls were showing up in the density of states and now they just cancel each other. So what we find is that the density of states, this is phonon density of states in frequency space, um, regardless of the dimension, it's inversely proportional to the group velocity, and then it is uh, proportional to the wave vector k uh, raised to the power of the dimensionality minus 1. So in 1D, k to the power 1 minus 1 is 0, and so we have a constant density of states, at least if the group velocity is constant, and so on. And that kind of gives us an idea of, of the dimensionality, the problem if we can understand uh, what that k exponent is. For electrons, again, most of the time we, we uh, work in energy space instead of frequency space. And here we showed uh, a common approximation for an electron band. This is a parabolic band. So this is where the energy is proportional to the wave vector squared. And in this case, we've, we have a, a band minimum. So we put a, a band minimum at a unit of 0.5 in this normalized energy scale. And what we see is that if I have low wave vectors, so here in the, in the region where k is small, what I'd like to do to understand density of states in energy space is if I had a grouping of allowable wave vectors uh, k, and this is lowercase k, remember that corresponds to electrons. It's the same k space, but I just want to be uh, use use some of this uh, some of these symbols to to help to uh, distinguish between electrons and phonons. So these, uh, these k states map to energy states and on this energy range, for this case, for, this l for these low wave vectors, the energy states or these states map to a fairly narrow range of energy. Whereas, in contrast, if I move up to higher wave vectors, that would, be, that would mean smaller wavelengths and higher energies, uh, those k states map to a much broader range of energy, as shown here. So the density of states um, in the high energy part of the, of the spectrum is lower because those states are spread out more. And so this electron density of states, again, it also depends on dimensionality. Uh, we, we can derive a few things from it. Uh, most of the time when you're talking about density of states and electrons, uh, people want to introduce the idea of bands uh, for this course and, and semiconductors and band gaps. Uh, but for this course, we're gonna try to focus mostly 
on metals and not worry about this too much. Uh, but we do want to introduce some of the features just so that they're, so that you're familiar with with them. And then we'll we'll also talk about some other materials as well that have you know, quite unique band gaps and uh, dispersions, energy dispersions. But this graph showed what these electron density of states look like in the different dimensionalities for multiple bands. So when, wherever there's a step change in one of these curves, that means we're hitting another electron band. So it's a, it's a bit of a complication. It, it won't uh, burden us too much in this course because we'll try not to do too much with multiple bands. Speaking of multiple bands, here's a, an image of graphene. Just to show you, uh, I decided to put this in. This, is, this was an extra thing that wasn't covered in the lectures. But if we wanted to look at the EK space for uh, graphene, this is what it would look like near the Fermi level where we have, again, this is K space, um, and the vertical scale on the left in this three-dimensional drawing, that's, that's energy, and the, uh, the X and Y are, uh, are K space. And uh, don't be confused by the capital K here. Those are actually called K points, or those are Dirac points, where you can see it quite well here. At a K space, actually the dispersion starts to look like a cone and I'm drawing that in here and it's a I'm going into two bands this is a, a case graphene itself pure graphene is a material that's is, that's formally called a semi-metal because the bottom band here that's called the pi band that is uh, full of electrons and it just touches at these k points the band above it that's the pi star band that's empty at least at, at uh, zero kelvin and at their point of intersection, the curves are actually linear at all of these K, K points. There's six of them. Uh, and so that's a, that's a very strange type of dispersion. It's, it's a little bit like light. Um, the, they have a linear dispersion. Again, this is very near the Fermi energy. But then you see, as you come up uh, higher in the energy scale, then you lose that linearity. In fact, um, the M point, which I'm circling right now, that's called the saddle point, um, so, and, and that is a place where the dispersion is actually flat. You'll also see graphs like this. I just want to introduce it here. The gamma point is at the center of the Brillouin zone. And so if we wanted to go from the center of the Brillouin zone, which is kind of back in here, where I'm drawing on the left curve now, to a K point, it's symmetric. There's a high degree of symmetry. Uh, in uh, for graphene and its dispersion curves. So if I wanted to look at how the energy was distributed there uh, uh, between gamma and K, it would look like this, uh, where I'm drawing in this direction. For both bands, those, that's the pi band on the bottom and the pi star band on top. And you see, as we said, when it reaches the K point, these two things become these two, uh, these two bands become fairly linear and they look like a cone. Um, if I wanted to go in a different dire direction, instead not from the gamma point of, the, of, the, uh, of this reciprocal space, but to the M point, then I would move, th those curves would look like this. And here's the M point, and you can see here that there's a band gap. Um, at the M point between the pi star, the conduction band, and the pi band, the valence band. And then there's, of course, we could also connect the M point to the K point, and that's the far right of the curve here. And it's kind of shown in this cutout. The bottom curve down here is actually a cutout view of K space. And in this case, what they've done is they've taken uh, the, the gamma, that's again the center, gamma K, um, gamma K prime uh, or and, and gamma M and they put all of those onto one graph on the top here so it's quite complicated as you might expect uh, but it's it's uh, mathematically it's not too difficult graphing uh, the the mathematical description of the EK relation is, is pretty simple even away from the K point Lastly, we went through uh, an exercise in the final two lectures of the week before this one uh, where we looked at Planck's Law. And we started with this, uh, this notion of 
uh, of a photon gas or a boson gas inside of a box. And the first thing we did is we restricted the allowable wavelengths. And just like we had restrictions on the wavelengths when we had a lattice carrying the energy, this box and the boundary conditions uh, imposed by the box create restrictions on the wavelengths and therefore they create allowable wave vectors inside of the box. What we did from there is we calculated uh, the energy density that's the, the density per unit volume of this photon field that's inside the box. And from that, we derived intensities. And I hope you'll recall, intensity is essentially a heat flux, a heat flow rate per unit area. And so to calculate that, we have a couple of, a couple of things here. So we have U prime. So U prime is here. There should be a prime right on this. There are on the, on the bottom ones. Um, multiplied by C, where C is the speed of light, and divided by 2 pi. In this case, the 2 pi is that, uh, is that solid angle of the hemisphere from a pinhole that we have put in the box to allow light to escape. And then the 1 half term comes from, uh, it comes from the, uh, the fact that only half of that, of that energy density is able to move up. The other half is moving down. Uh, and then we can express this spectral intensity in, in different spectral coordinates. So we could do it in terms of wavelength or we could do it in, in terms of, of the normal frequency um, as opposed to the angular frequency. We could also do it in terms of energy. And once we've done that, we find that we can plot the spectral intensity on any of those coordinates, whether, uh, whether it be wavelength, frequency, or energy. Here we've chosen frequency, and we see that there's a, a profound temperature effect. So as temperature increases, the peak, the, the frequency at which the intensity is, is maximum increases. Um, and especially if, if we go to very low temperatures, you see that we're getting down to you know, changes of about an order of magnitude in that angular frequency. Therefore, that changes the energy by an order of magnitude. And you see that there's a, um, there's a peak. And this, uh, many people uh, have studied this or are interested in this for photon systems, for light systems, and looking at, um, at how light, at where the, the peak energies in light, especially in the solar spectrum, which is in the visible range. Um, and we'll talk especially about uh, peak frequencies for phonon transport uh, a little bit later in the course. And we'll try to understand how, uh, where the energy is contained within a phonon field that is transporting energy. That's a, that's a big topic lately, and it's an important one to understand. This is, um, this is the analog for uh, thermal radiation, photon radiation. All right, so that's it for today and the week, and I will see you next week.